Good afternoon to our viewers in Germany and good morning to our viewers in the United States. I'm Steve Sokol. I'm the president of the American Council on Germany. I'd like to welcome you to today's discussion on Germany's G7 priorities. This is the first in a series of events which are being organized by the ACG and the German Embassy in Washington, D.C. to highlight the issues on the G7 agenda this year. I can hardly think of a better person to kick off this series than Dr. Jörg Cookies. He is State Secretary in the Federal Chancellery, where he is responsible for economic issues, finance, and European affairs, and also responsible for coordinating G7 and G20 matters. His full bio was just posted to the chat. State Secretary Cookies, herzlich willkommen. Thank you and uh, many thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak and, um, and to present the G7 priorities that we've established and um, of course the transatlantic um, unity on all things G7 is uh, very near and dear to all of our heart and uh, so I'm very happy that, uh, that we're here. In fact, uh, um, as we speak, I uh, just left a, uh, a conversation between President Biden and Chancellor Scholz, um, among others, to discuss the current events, um, including, of course, everything that pertains to the G7. So it's also uh, very good that uh, what we're doing in the G7 is accompanied by great unity between uh, the US and Germany. So um, that's, uh, that's also a very important element of the, of the presidency that we have. Of course, the presidency has been heavily affected by the Russian invasion of Ukraine. What we thought would be priorities um, before the 24th of February uh, has, of course, uh, been changed very fundamentally. Um, however, on the other side, of course, many of the um, many of the challenges that we were facing before 24th of February have only been compounded by the Russian aggression against Ukraine. Um, the topic um, of, um, of, of health is a good example. Uh, the COVID-19 situation, um, of course, uh, uh, continues to be a threat, even though the media attention has gone down quite severely. The topic of food security uh, has regained a completely different dimension as a result of the um, the ruthlessness of the Russian attack, including on agricultural supplies um, and um, and uh, and um, inventories. Uh, so, in that sense, um, it's uh, it's of course a um, massive um, and severe impact. Our second priority, global um, economic growth and uh, and stability, has of course also taken a very substantial um, hit due to the. Uh, uh, all of the repercussions of the of the war um, against the Ukraine. So, in that sense, uh, we are of course uh, um, adjusting our priorities. But many of the priorities that we established um, in January uh, got even more highlighted as a result of the regression uh, of the aggression. Um, we've really seen, though. Um, I would say in terms of uh, a, a, a positive aspect that the response of the G7 and all of the countries in NATO, in the European Union, um, has really been a massive uh, positive element. Um, multilateralism has really succeeded. The unity with which uh, the G7 imposed sanctions within a few days illustrates the, the work that we did um, before the invasion, actually, because we, of course, had some clear warning signs that this uh, could potentially happen. Um, so the fact that uh, the invasion um, took place on the 24th and we had our first package of sanctions um, um, ready for decision that very day and followed up by a severe set of sanctions over the weekend um, on the 20. Uh, 7th of uh, February also shows that we were resolute and quick to act. And that is certainly something that uh, Putin was not expecting and uh, did not have on his cards. He was hoping for disunity. He was hoping for weakness. Um, he got exactly the opposite. So I think that's also a, a, an important sign and important component 
of the G7 presidency that were very happy that we could contribute to this unity of the Western world against this unbelievably aggressive and um, and um, brutal um, warfare that uh, Putin is uh, engaging in in, um, in, um, in the Ukraine. Of course, the geopolitical situation has um, become complex. Um, all of the things surrounding uh, the reaction of, uh, of uh, other countries um, has complicated matters. It has made matters in, indefinitely complex in the other big um, body of global coordination, namely the G20, uh, where we believe the future is uh, very much up in the air and uncertain. We're doing what we can to stabilize the G20, of course, and to uh, support the Indonesian presidency. Um, but of course, it's, uh, it's clear that due to the composition of the G20, that um, institution will, will have a really hard, um, a hard time. Um, and we've made it very clear that we will not go to business as usual in the G20. Uh, we will use all opportunities um, in the G20 and insist that if the G20 gets together, um, the um, issues of the fundamental violation of the international order uh, by the Russian aggression against Ukraine has to be addressed and has to be um, discussed and has to be put to the forefront, even though, as we know, um, realistically, the G20 will definitely not come to an agreement on this topic. <laughs> what are the topics of the G7 um, that we've um, selected on the first uh, forefront and certainly rising to the, to the front is the topic um, and the priority of strength and values and democracies um, the um, ripple effects of Russia's unjustifi uh, unjustifiable invasion of the Ukraine um, related to the dire humanitarian crisis, the um, acute um, food situation um, percolating, of course, from the dire situation in the Ukraine itself um, to um, many regions that are um, used to importing uh, food stock from the war-stricken areas, the problems and the repercussions of the energy supply shocks, um, the pervasive spread of disinformation, um, the manipulation of information, um, all by the Russian government, of course, is a massive uh, deterrent to the values that uh, the G7 have. Um, so the topic, um, the priority uh, of resilient democracies that we also um, published before the invasion, of course, has become only more relevant um, due to what we are, what what we and the Ukraine is experiencing. Climate is also a hugely important topic that has only increased in um, in importance. Um, we propose the concept of an open and inclusive climate club as a response um, to um, to all um, to to showing uh, global unity. Uh, we've shown unity in. Um, reducing our dependence on Russian fossil sources of energy. But of course, as we're learning how tight the supplies are, um, the conclusion that uh, a renewable energy drive is more important than ever, I think, is, is a consensus topic in the G7. Um, figuring out how exactly the different approaches within the G7 on achieving climate neutrality can be uh, can be. Um, um, merged into a common denominator, of course, is quite challenging because the approaches within the G7 are quite diverse. Um, but uh, the three pillars of the Climate Club, um, first of all, uh, finding a consensus on how to price regulate um, carbon um, emissions, how to incentivize the reduction thereof, um, is the first pillar. The second pillar is the collaboration globally on decarbonizing our industry, uh, which of course is a very technology-driven approach. And the third pillar of the Climate Club is the concept of just energy transition partnerships. Uh, the, uh, the G7 has the first of these partnerships with South Africa, where we are um, using billions of funding through the, um, through the budgets of the countries and the multilateral financial organizations to help South Africa on the path of decarbonization. Our goal is to roll that concept out 
uh, to other of the large um, economies of the global south and to really illustrate that this is a partnership. Um, I've mentioned all of the issues around economic recovery and stability, which is the next big uh, priority that we have. I think it's needless to say that as um, inflation dynamics are picking up and growth is slowing down as a result of uh, many of the um, second round effects of the Russian aggression um, on the Ukraine, I think it's extremely important that we, we work together on stabilizing our economies just like we did uh, during the COVID crisis. This is a really serious challenge. Um, the central banks are, um, are working together and I think it's very clear that the governments also have to work together to achieve um, economic recovery and stability um, in all aspects. Then, of course, health, as I said, um, even though in terms of uh, all of the statistics that we see in terms of media coverage, of course, health has uh, uh, gone from the absolute top um, item uh, to a, in my view, quite neglected topic, of course, now given the issues in China around COVID, um, the, the media interest has increased again. Uh, but uh, in our view, we have to stabilize the, the interest and make sure that the health challenges um, due to COVID, but other, also many other issues um, related to viral infections, um, the risk of disease spreading, the risk of antimicrobial resistance, and many of the other global health issues, um, which are of course, confronted with a far too weak uh, World Health Organization and far too weak um, governance and infrastructure on uh, the global health system, I think is a big topic that uh, we cannot um, allow to be um, reduced um, in terms of the amount of attention that we um, give to it. Infrastructure is a further topic which uh, is, is a huge, hu of huge importance. We see infrastructure holistically, whether it's energy infrastructure, um, health infrastructure, transport infrastructure, um, all of these elements um, deserve a lot of focus and a lot of um, attention. We have to find a common ground between what the US is doing on Build Back Better, what Europe is doing on Global Gateway, what the UK is doing, what Asia is doing, um, to set a counter example to the Belt and Road Initiative, which we're seeing more and more as the economic situation gets more challenging, more and more countries who have been financed by the Belt and Road Initiatives are seeing the, the actually disadvantageous terms and conditions um, that uh, China is imposing on many uh, borrowers. And uh, through the infrastructure initiative, we want to set a very conscious, positive example of financing sustainable infrastructure in a sustainable uh, fair and partnership driven way. So uh, the infrastructure initiative globally, of course, um, is of uh, increased concern and increased interest, of course, given uh, what we're seeing um, happening in the world. So those would be our big priorities. And I'm happy to engage in discussion and to, to hear what's on your mind. Thank you. State Secretary Cookies, thank you so much for this, for this overview. Um, you know, I was thinking in, in anticipation of our conversation about where Germany started the year um, in terms of really an ambitious agenda uh, under the heading progress towards an equitable world uh, and how the world has changed since the beginning of the year and how the, um, Germany has had to adapt. Um, and, and one of the things you know, that you touched on is, is how some of that adaptation has already um, happened in terms of the, the priorities for Germany this year. Um, and you've outlined a number of key areas that were important before the war in Ukraine started, but that take on a new sort of importance in light of that war. And I guess, you know, one question that I have for you is as you look at these different areas, whether it's climate, economic recovery and economic stability, public health, infrastructure, each of these issues is interconnected in many ways. Um, is the approach to these individual areas siloed or are you taking more of a, a broad holistic approach as you try to take on these different topics? Yeah, I mean, I think it's very clear that, uh, I mean, we discussed quite a lot on how to structure the priorities because of course the 
um, they, they are all interlinked. Um, when we talk about infrastructure um, and we talk about climate, uh, we're seeing as we speak, um, all of our energy infrastructure is, is, uh, is misguided um, in the sense that uh, all energy flows in Europe, for example, flow east to west, and they are all, are all directed towards, um, towards importing um, fossil fuels that, given the plan that we have um, in where, where we're headed, is the completely wrong infrastructure. Um, because it creates uh, unilateral dependencies, um, it creates a lack of interconnectivity. And if you look at all of the, um, if you look at all of the um, structures in the European Union, for example, the amount of interconnectedness is far too low. Um, um, the Commission has some very ambitious plans to change that, um, and the ability to import. Uh, um, energy, for example, from Northern Africa is far too small, given the um, given the challenge that we have of substituting away from uh, from uh, Russian sources of energy. The other big topic that cuts across and that is uh, that is uh, a, a non silo topic is, of course, the topic of gender balance. Um, we discussed quite long whether um, whether gender should be a priority in and of itself, but we decided that we will follow the, the structure and the strategy of gender mainstreaming, i.e. gender plays a substantial role in all of these elements, um, um, because uh, as we see on financial stability, we're seeing as one of the key impediments to growth being um, the lack of female participation in many regions of the world. Uh, we're seeing the um, the access to vaccines in a large part of the global south being um, gender unbalanced, um, and many of these so many of these topics um, are clearly um, cross sectoral. And uh, we consciously decided, um, also um, after discussions with the Women Seven Initiative, to uh, to prioritize gender as a mainstreaming topic that cuts across all elements. Um, so the answer is we're trying to tear down silos as much as we can. Well, I'm, I'm really pleased that you brought up the issue of, of gender equality because one of our viewers um, just submitted a question um, focused on the fact that each of these crises, whether one's talking about the war in Ukraine, COVID, climate change, um, or even economic downturns have disproportionately impacted women. And so um, the, the viewer was curious as to, to what degree gender equity, gender equality issues play into um, the G7 priorities. And it sounds as if it is at the top of, of your list. Yes, it, um, as I said, it, uh, it cuts across. And uh, of course, uh, we're seeing um, firsthand all of the tragedy and the violence um, from uh, the Russian aggression against Ukraine, because uh, of course, the vast majority of the um, refugees who are coming to our countries in hundreds and hundreds of thousands um, are women. Um, and the, the, the stories they tell are so dramatic um, that, um, that it really shows that uh, violence um, against women um, is, is a, uh, um, um, uh, an element of this warfare which violates all um, all um, civil and uh, and um, and international law treaties that Russia itself has committed to. So, um, of course, as you say, it's uh, it's a very uh, dramatic um, element of uh, our of our fight against this uh, war. State Secretary Cookies, I'd, I'd like to bring in one of our viewers, um, a young leader alumna from our program, uh, our, our German American Young Leaders Program here in New York, Tara Hariharan. She has a, a question for you. Tara, your mic should be unmuted. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Cookies. Uh, very much appreciate your comments. Uh, two quick questions. Um, first of all, as we see Europe uh, progressing towards the uh, likelihood of an embargo on uh, Russian oil imports, will this G7 meeting uh, cover more measures to try to get the rest of the world to also get on board in um, in uh, ma making a, a much more sterner stance towards Russia? In fact, for instance, I heard that Germany was thinking of inviting India to the, the G7 meeting. 
and uh, I wondered if this was a topic on hand. And the second thing, given that you wear many hats and given your uh, economic and uh, fiscal policy expertise, uh, I wondered if more broadly, given also the issues of sustainability and environmental concerns you mentioned as a topic for the G7, uh, where the, um, uh, the, the German government right now stands on fiscal policy for Europe and the possibility of new fiscal instruments uh, to ensure that uh, spending, whether it be on infrastructure or on environmental uh, priorities, is uh, is focused on in the next few years. Thank you. Yes. Um, so on oil, um, yes, it's true that uh, Germany uh, has done its homework, and um, we first um, in the uh, sequence of all of the dependencies that we had um, on Russia worked on reducing our uh, dependence on coal imports from Russia. We used to have close to 50% of our coal imports coming from Russia. We diversified away from that. Um, since December, we've been working extremely hard on this topic. Um, we succeeded and we now have a very diversified sources of, uh, of coal imports. And we were able to agree to uh, banning um, coal imports from Russia altogether from the European Union. Um, so as you say, oil is next. Um, we've worked enormously hard with our industry um, and with global players in this uh, market uh, to make sure that uh, we can do this in a way that doesn't uh, um, over severely impact our economic strength. Um, even doing this, we're seeing that um, of course, uh, taking the population on board is not a trivial matter. We have very substantial refining activities uh, connected to the so-called Druzhba pipeline coming from Russia, where all of the Russian um, oil imports into our country are taking place. And of course, it's uh, not trivial uh, to, um, to um, transform these, um, these industrial sites uh, that uh, have for decades lived off uh, a cheap Russian oil. Um, and of course, the, uh, the, the, you have to take along the citizens and the populations that are affected in the regions. Um, we've now found concepts um, together. We worked uh, very intensely also with the uh, Polish government because some of the logistics uh, pathways into um, finding alternatives to Russian oil go through Poland and its ports and the Eastern seaboard. Um, so we've we've succeeded now in um, coming along in our diversification far enough that we can say yes, we will join the, the European Union's uh, plea for uh, uh, oil embargo against Russia. We're still discussing a few details, um, so that all of that is still a work in progress. And of course, the next step then would be uh, discussing with uh, with non G seven members on uh, on joining the this this effort. Of course, we are fully aware that this is a difficult topic and, uh, and the G7 um, can only decide on what, what they do on their own. Um, every country um, has its sovereignty on its energy mix. But of course, the G7 wants to work together with, uh, with all countries. And of course, um, when uh, Mr. Modi um, was in uh, Berlin um, at, um, at the beginning of the week, we of course also had discussions with him on how we can work together on all of these things. Um, but of course, we uh, completely accept and acknowledge that every country makes these decisions on uh, sovereign terms that we can only offer to work together. On sustainability, we are completely in line with your, uh, with your statement. Um, we just announced our Easter package. Um, the um, Ministry of Economics and Climate Action is, is taking the lead on that. Um, which will massively transform our country and our industry. Uh, we aim to go to 80% renewable energy in our electricity uh, production by the end of this decade. Um, that will mean that uh, we will give all of those um, on this call who are engaged in investing into um, energy infrastructure, a lot of opportunities to uh, engage with us uh, because Germany will become a uh, mega gigawatt uh, um, um, constructor of new sources of renewable energy, and that's in the uh, area of offshore wind, onshore wind, photovoltaics, the grid to transport all of the electricity that we're going to generate through renewable energy sources from uh, 
north to south uh, and will be will require hundreds and hundreds of billions of euros of investments. And of course, uh, given the nature of the investment, it is sustainable investment in a strong ESG country. So uh, we are already discussing with a lot of investors um, and providers of, uh, of capital on how they can participate in this in this effort. And uh, it's going to be a very, very substantial initiative. And exactly the question that you ask on fiscal is a, is a reason why we are um, moving to uh, talking to a lot of private sector investors, because of course, through the uh, crises that we experienced uh, first on COVID, then now and due to the current situation, um, our fiscal space is of course uh, limited. Um, however, what we're seeing and hearing is extremely encouraging. A lot of pension funds, a lot of mutual funds, a lot of private equity firms are telling us that there is a private sector um, engagement of massive size looking for, uh, for renewable energy investments. So in that sense, we are quite optimistic that um, as our coalition contract postulates, the vast majority of these hundreds of billions of euros of investments is going to come from the global investor community. Um, and uh, we are committed to uh, reducing planning permission times, to facilitating the expansion of our grid, um, and to, to allow this type of investment to really materialize in very, very large scale. And that, um, as you asked also at the European level, is consensus. That is a big part of the Fit for 55 exercise. Um, we're going to see in all European countries a big, big move into um, renewable energy uh, because the Next Generation EU program that we uh, proposed together with France um, as a re reaction of the, uh, to the COVID crisis is now up and running. And the several hundreds of billions that are being deployed that way are really now starting to be, um, to be granted and uh, approved and put to work. So the European Union will um, have a lot of fiscal capacity exactly at the right time to, uh, to build out its uh, renewable energy push. State Secretary Cookies, uh, at, at the beginning of the year, um, as, as Germany was embarking on, on this G7 presidency, um, it seemed as if China was going to play a central role in terms of considerations um, of, of the group. Um, and it seems that with some of the current developments, China has maybe been, been pushed off the agenda a little bit. And I certainly had a couple of questions about China, but a number of our viewers have also posed questions about China. One of our viewers asks, how will the G7 position itself towards China this year? And another one is curious, um, based on the, the unified response of the G7 on Ukraine, will there be a clear and candid um, response to China's transgressions when it comes to human rights, crackdowns on democrat democratic movements, military provocations? Um, how, how do you see the G7 approaching China this year? Um, I mean, we, of course, had a, a large number of discussions on that. And the answer is, first of all, there is no deprioritization whatsoever, because, of course, all of the topics that you mentioned <clears throat> Um, are things that um, that um, that um, have been addressed by the G7 in the past, um, and if I see what uh, is happening in terms of uh, in terms of um, conflicts and um, discussions, of course these things have not gone away. Uh, so certainly we will um, we will continue uh, to uh, to, um, to continue the course on uh, on China that. The UK presidency um, already started uh, at the G7 um, uh, summit in Carbis Bay, um, but of course we will take into account all of these uh, elements uh, that uh, that you mentioned um, and uh, and update them. Of course, um, the G7 has been quite clear in its communication since uh, since the beginning of the year to call um, for China to respect. Um, many of the um, the global um, rule-based order elements. Um, we've appealed to all countries uh, to um, to join the G7 in its condemnation of Russian aggression against the Ukraine. As you all know, um, China has opted not to participate, rather take a neutral stance. Um, but of course, many of the priorities that uh, that we have. 
um, um, in our G7 program also pertain to some of the elements that you mentioned, um, in particular, uh, the level playing field topic where we are seeing more and more um, feedback from, uh, con from companies in the G7 that market access, um, the granting of market access and the re in China and the request of market access for Chinese companies is not level at all. Um, so that's certainly a topic that we are looking at. I've talked a little bit about the uh, counter uh, point that we are looking to set um, to some of the elements of the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, of course, the WTO reform is something that is near and dear to our heart as an export driven country. Um, so in that sense, um, the, the, all of these elements uh, are, are certainly topics uh, for discussion. At the same time, um, we are fully aware that uh, things like uh, achieving global climate neutrality can only be achieved if China joins the effort and uh, participates in the effort. So uh, we will continue to engage with China um, with all the um, points that we raise um, of criticism, uh, we also think that we have to find a way to build bridges that uh, China can continue um, and can uh, can join the global effort on achieving climate neutrality. And on on that element, we're certainly um, in, we we receive positive signals in Glasgow, and we continue to see positive signals that the that the Chinese government does understand that we have to work together on this element. So before we um, drill down a little bit more on, on climate, I do wanna ask um, a, a follow-up question on China, because of course, one of the issues that, that comes up when thinking about the economic recovery and economic stability piece of the G7 agenda is supply chain security. And of course, China plays a, a huge role there. Um, one of our viewers is, is interested to know um, how we can develop a greater collaboration with China, um, how we can have a more resilient supply of materials and technology in order to ensure that supply chains function um, and that we actually achieve economic recovery and economic stability. Yes, I mean, needless to say, that's a huge component of our infrastructure uh, discussion. Um, it's a huge component uh, to strengthen the resilience of supply chains. Um, we have a very um, multilateral approach uh, in all of our components of, uh, of the G7 presidency. So we are firmly of the view that all of the disruptions that we've seen to global supply chains definitely cannot be answered by a sort of retraction into um, autonomous uh, economies where everyone believes they can do um, do things on their own. We really see the most massive adverse example of the attempt to uh, to become autonomous um, with the example of Russia. We're probably one of the countries that has the biggest wealth potential is stagnant and uh, is uh, is uh, is not growing at all due to the uh, the restrictions on the one side, of course, imposed by the Western world as a result of the Russian aggression against Crimea, but also the conscious decision of the uh, regime in Russia to withdraw from international cooperation um, basically since 2014. So we think multilateralism is really the answer and, uh, and are completely convinced that uh, what we're doing in terms of integration is the right response to that. Um, the first example, by the way, um, speaking to the um, American Council, is the very positive example um, that we had at uh, in March, where Intel decided to uh, a invest a massive amount of money, namely 33 billion uh, euros, into the European economy. Uh, but of course, uh, we will not. Uh, uh, neglect to say that we were particularly happy that of the 33 billion, 17 billion is going into the um, into a new Giga Fab in the city of Magdeburg um, in Germany. So uh, the fact that uh, that that the fact that um, we saw this massive disruption of semiconductor uh, supply chains um, really had a macroeconomic impact on us because the reduction of production in many of our sectors from the automotive to the machine tool industry 
um, as a result of the uh, shortage of supply of semiconductors really showed to us that we have to that we that we have to work very very hard on this uh, topic and um, and uh, so in that sense the the strategy of reducing dependencies vulnerabilities to shocks um, is epitomized by this uh, by the fact that we are building um, um, and working together with uh, with uh, U.S. corporates um, but also global the global semiconductor industry and uh, our anticipation. Um, is that uh, this will not be the last you're hearing of uh, the semiconductor industry's involvement in Germany because it's extremely interesting to hear and to see that uh, the, the initiative that we took with getting Intel to make this massive investment in Germany leads now to a huge inflow of requests and questions and interest in our country from a lot of technology companies um, around the world and um, in the US. So this is um, this is an example where um, where we will um, see more integration and um, and see a lot of um, a lot of uh, further integration of our countries and of course the Tesla uh, um, gigafactory yeah. in uh, about thirty miles from where I'm sitting at the moment is also a very good example that uh, that our countries are facing um, are are doing everything but uh, retracting we're integrating more and more. Um, I, I certainly think in terms of semiconductors and supply chains, um, we're seeing a, a very new um, opportunity between Germany and the United States to collaborate more closely. And it's not just because of the war in Ukraine, but really comes um, out of the past two years and the way in which supply chains were impacted by COVID uh, and what we are, are learning out of that. So. Um, perhaps as, as we transition from, from talking about China to talking a little bit more about climate, one of our, our viewers um, poses the, the following question. What do you make of China's recent moves to significantly increase the share of coal-fired power plants, increase subsidies on coal, and in effect, walk away from its Glasgow commitments? Well, it's uh, to be honest, it's very hard to read that precisely because, of course, it, as you say, it's um, runs counter to the commitments that uh, China made and is still committed to. Um, so in that sense, uh, I mean, of course, we're seeing that uh, there is a substitution effect going on. Um, and you could say the same thing of Germany, because the fraction of our energy production over the past few months um, pertaining to coal has actually increased as well. But that was not a conscious policy decision that was merely the price effect of oil and gas spiking massively and supply shortages coming up um, through the system um, that then led to just pure market pricing signals being, being responded to by economic agents in free markets. And that has increased coal um, consumption also in our country. Um, we think this is a very, very temporary phenomenon. Um, in Germany, the the uh, fact that we have, have introduced carbon pricing, that we are um, phasing out coal, means that this will be a temporary phenomenon. But we're very carefully monitoring uh, what uh, what China is doing, because of course the the carbon footprint, um, if China were to renege on its uh, on its um, um, commitments, which we don't expect, but uh, if it w if it were to happen, of course it would have a very substantial adverse impact. But um, as I said, in all of our discussions with the Chinese government, we're not hearing that they are planning to uh, to retract from the commitments. So we assume that this will be only a temporary reaction to all of the disequilibria that we've had in uh, in global energy markets mm -hmm. rather than a stra strategy. So State Secretary Cookies, a, a number of viewers have noted that the developing countries are disproportionately impacted by extreme weather and other climate effects. Um, this of course has exacerbated challenges such as food and health security. And so there have been a couple of questions. One person is curious to know what the G7 is planning to do to help these vulnerable countries manage and adapt to climate impact and also to, to work on mitigation. Um, and another viewer is curious how the G7 can make sure that this year's energy and climate ministers and leaders summit bridges the north-south gap. Um, in effect, what instruments will the G7 have to address this 
in addition to the climate club? Yep. Well, I, th I think the key instrument will be the just energy transition partnerships that we are building out, um, which will provide a mechanism and an instrument for the G7 countries uh, to work together with the in international financial institutions um, to, um, to partner up with countries of the global south on the one side to decarbonize their their economies in a systematic way, um, but also uh, taking into account possib the possibility, A, to, uh, to increase the supply of electricity and basic energy needs to their own population, but B, of course, also potentially exploit opportunities in global markets to, uh, to export energy. Of course, that's a somewhat delicate topic. Um, I'm talking to African leaders about uh, green hydrogen exports as a business opportunity um, also al al always gets the um, critical counter question, uh, how should a, a continent with hundreds of millions of citizens without access to the electricity grid even uh, think about exporting um, um, green hydrogen at this stage? Uh, but I think the, the fact that we want to partner with these countries to, first of all, make sure that, uh, that uh, sustainable energy is produced in these sufficient quantities to even have the discussion about, do I consume or do I export, would already be a massive positive step. And with all of the countries that we talked to at the EU Africa Summit, um, the potential for sustainable energy build out is just massive um, on the Indian continent, but the same goes for uh, Latin America, the same goes for the Asia Pacific region. So in that sense, uh, the, the potential is there and you will see uh, ELMAO will, will include a big, big commitment to, uh, to rolling this out and to making it more concrete. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a follow on, um, one of our viewers is curious about your assessment of the prospects for the climate club. Um, Japan and the United States are are not convinced of the idea so far. Uh, so how under Germany's leadership can you ensure that the club is, is designed in a way to be inclusive and, and that there are commitments from other countries? Yes, yeah, so I would say there's two issues and uh, two groups of countries that we have to convince. As you said, um, the US and uh, Japan have a different approach uh, from, uh, from other countries on carbon pricing. Uh, so that is certainly something that we we want to address. Um, certainly, the the climate club will entail an acceptance of energy um, sovereignty of all nations. Um, that is a very important uh, concept. As we speak, as we see um, in this uh, day and age, it is something that uh, severely affects societies. Um, in a very strong way. So the, the, the fact that energy is something very strategic and very important to country sovereignty is completely acceptable. Um, so what is our response to that? The response is that we want to find ways to make um, the different approaches of those countries who are committed to achieving climate neutrality in line with the Paris Agreement um, um, feasible. And of course, we completely accept that, um, for example, the U.S., wants to focus on incentives, on regulation um, and other instruments. Other countries such as Germany want to rely on carbon pricing in addition to some of the other instruments. So in that sense, I think what we have to figure out and the OECD and the IMF are working very hard with extremely smart people on this topic is how to make direct and indirect ways of incentivizing the reduction of carbon emissions comparable. That I think is, uh, is going to be one of the um, royal disciplines of economics and, um, and energy technology and understanding of energy um, transformation. <clears throat> because if we achieve that goal in cooperation with the OECD and the IMF on how that actually can be done, I think a lot will be achieved in the policy debate um, at the global level. The second question, once we figured out how to bridge the differences within the G7, is of course how we then translate that into a global effort. Uh, because as I said, we want to be open and inclusive. 
Um, and of course, um, when um, Prime Minister Modi was in um, Berlin at the beginning of the week, he came um, and he told us in great detail um, how massively the current heat wave is affecting his country and his citizens. Um, um, so in that sense, uh, you know, climate change is very, very real. It's very, very tangible. Um, and, um, and we will work together with the Indian government. Uh, the, the heads of state and government agreed that um, very, very intensively on finding out how India can join the, the um, climate club, how we can work together on all of these issues. <clears throat> and then, of course, we're engaging in the context of the G20 G7 presidencies very substantially with uh, with Indonesia. Um, so in that sense, you know, all of these dis discussions are uh, characterized by a huge amount of uh, willingness to cooperate. Thank you. We, we don't have a lot of time left, and there are at least two topics I'd like to try to get to before we, we run out of time. One is perhaps very briefly, you know, you had touched on the issue of food security. And of course, this is something of, of tremendous concern, not just because of the, the war in Ukraine and, and concerns about the breadbasket being um, being upset and number of, of countries not having access to affordable food. Um, several of our viewers are, are curious um, how food security factors into the priorities of the G7 right now. Massively. I mean, it's it's very clear that uh, that we need an answer. Uh, a, we are working, of course, on the infrastructure pillar um, together with other G7 countries, in this case, mainly the, those in Europe, on figuring out what ways we can find to help Ukraine um, maintain their ex export capabilities. So how can we use the rail system? How can we use the road system? To, subs to substitute away, um, because of course Russia using uh, food as an instrument of war has blocked all uh, of the traditional pathways of, uh, of Ukrainian exports, namely the ports, um, um, in particular Odessa, uh, which was an enormously important um, um, port for, for the export of, um, of, um, of um, food stock. Um, on the other side, of course, we need to work with the countries, the importing countries, because, of course, um, the, the massive price increase leads to fiscal strains, and we're already seeing the repercussions of that, uh, both in terms of the cost of direct imports, but also the need to stabilize societies with fiscal manners. And that, of course, is putting a huge amount of stress on many countries in the global south. And we're working together with the IMF, the World Bank, on uh, trying to address these issues. And uh, ELMAO will be a very good venue for discussion because everyone will be there and uh, we'll have a lot of uh, the convening power of the G7 there and the, of course, also decision-making power of the G7. <clears throat> you've, in, in the course of this conversation, obviously, you've talked a lot about the importance of multilateralism. Um, you've talked about unity vis-a-vis uh, -vis Russia in light of, of Russia's war in, in Ukraine. And you've even talked about how the G7 can, can act more broadly, but I'd like to give you a, a, a chance to sort of answer the, the following question explicitly because the G7 is a small club. Um, so how can the G7 really build partnerships, strengthen partnerships and engage a wider circle? Um, you've given us some examples so far but is there is there more that you would like to contribute to that? Yes, I mean again, I'd uh, I'd like to refer the to the conversation that we had with the German Indian uh, government consultations um, early this week. As you know, um, India abstained from the from the um, from the um, UN votes. Um, on uh, on Russia um, Russia's invasion um, and uh, Prime Minister Modi gave a very um, elaborate and um, and thoughtful explanation of his uh, perspective um, and uh, I think it would be the worst mistake of the Western world or the G7 to so to speak give up and say oh you are neutral in this where we are so united um, um, we made the conscious decision to invite. India to the G7. Uh, we decided consciously to invite Senegal to the G7. We decided consciously to invite South Africa to, to the G7. All three abstained in the UN vote on Russia. But uh, 
our answer is we have to maintain the dialogue with uh, with all of these uh, huge co- countries. I think the 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 countries condemning the Russian attack were a bit over optimistic when we saw the result of the UN vote um, with only four countries voting against um, and 35 abstaining. Um, what the first um, analysis didn't show is that the countries abstaining ascribe for between 40 to 50 percent of global population. So that, of course, is very concerning. But as I said, we want to work together with those countries because uh, we do see in all of the discussions that we're having with them that um, that uh, they can be convinced that the topic of open democracies is also in their interest. A couple of our, our viewers are, are curious about, about Russia in the, the G7 slash G8 and, and G20 context. Um, obviously, Russia was suspended from the G8 after its annexation of Crimea. You mentioned earlier that it's unlikely that the G20 would turn into a G19. So how, do, um, how does the G7 and, and how do other governments deal with the possibility of, of Putin possibly attending the November meeting? Yes, um, well, we, we have to see how that goes. We can't uh, predict it now. We've uh, heard from uh, um, other G20 countries that they will not support the exclusion of Russia, um, given that uh, the G20 has to decide in consensus, uh, we don't have a choice. Um, so in that sense, um, you know, the Indonesian presidency has to extend the invitations. Uh, but we will make sure that uh, the Russian aggression is properly addressed. And uh, I really have to apologize, but uh, my office uh, just told me that I have to be downstairs to um, be in the delegation to greet the Prime Minister of the Czech Republic in eight minutes. I have to put okay. on a nice tie and uh, run downstairs, so I cannot be late for that. Apologies. Well, State Secretary Kukis, on behalf of the German Embassy in Washington and the American Council on Germany, I would like to thank you very, very much for, for joining us today. Um, this has been a fantastic discussion, and perhaps there are opportunities um, later in the year for us to reconnect and continue the conversation. But this has been fantastic. Uh, to our viewers, I would like to thank you for participating and thank for you. your questions. Uh, and over the next few months, we plan to organize a number of other events, uh, virtual events on Germany's G7 presidency, and we hope that you will join us again. Thanks to all of you for tuning in.